Hi everyone. Let's talk about precipitation reactions. Now precipitation reactions are just one type of reaction and in chemistry six there's three types of reactions. Precipitation reactions, oxidation reduction reactions, also known as redox reactions, and acid base reactions. So this video is going to talk about just the first type, precipitation. Okay, and so here's an illustration of a typical precipitation reaction. The pattern is that you have two reagents that dissolve in water. They are aqueous solutions, and they are completely soluble in water. So you can't tell this beaker containing water also has some barium nitrate dissolved in it. There's a chemical formula of barium nitrate. Let me get the pen going here. I got to turn that on. So. Sorry. There we go. Mark up the screen. <laughs> Here we go. So barium nitrate. Let's get the thicker pen going. Um, it looks like clear liquid. You'd have to do some chemical tests. Actually, <laughs> the precipitation reaction is a chemical test that could verify that it's not pure water. I'll describe that in a second. And then we have a second solution that has color, so that's a more obvious indicator that it's not pure water, something else is all in there. And this has potassium chromate in it. Hmm, nitrate chromate, those are two examples of polyatomic ions that we need to memorize. I know, memorization. Anyways, take these two liquids, they're clear liquids, um, they have compounds dissolved in them, and you mix them together. So it looks like this graduated cylinder has a potassium chlorate, chromate, potassium chromate solution in it, and we're adding it to the barium nitrate, and you see this cloud form. And that's where I kind of rationalize why is this called a precipitation reaction, right? On the weather forecast, we talk about chance of precipitation, meaning it's going to rain. And not really the same thing here. We're not raining water, we're raining little particles of solid. Yeah, it turns out when you mix barium nitrate, potassium chromate, you form a salt, an ionic compound that does not dissolve in water and it precipitates out. That's how the chemist describes it. You form a solid and these little particles solid, you can see them, it's, you know, it's reflecting or scattering the light. It's not a clear solution anymore. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that barium and chromate form a very strong ionic bond and water can't separate that easily. So the barium is a plus two cation, chromate plus a minus two. That has something to do with it. They form a tight ionic bond and um, then dissolve water. So it precipitates out. That is a precipitation reaction. And so we had this other guideline back a few videos ago that said, you know what? You have this pattern. Um, it was just a guideline that said, um, like dissolves like. And we said if a molecule is polar, it probably would dissolve in a polar solvent. And so polar dissolves polar. So water is a polar compound. Hey, table salt is very polar. It's got plus and minuses ions in it. That's a very polar compound. So that kind of helps us remember salt dissolves in water because salt's polar, water's polar, like dissolves like. And then we have something that, that that's the opposite of that. And um, oil and water do not mix. And again, it kind of follows the pattern like dissolves like. Oil tend to be nonpolar molecules, greasy, oily, waxy molecules. And water's polar. Oil's nonpolar. They are not alike. So they don't dissolve in each other. Okay, so that was a very general guideline. It was just like the it's not perfect. <laughs> it's just a guideline. And it turns out there's several cases where it's incorrect. And here's a case in point. Um, in a minute, we'll explain how we know that these little particles, these cloud of little precipitate, 
is formed from the molecule, the ionic compound, I should say, of barium chromate. It's a solid, not aqueous, like these other two. These would be aqueous. They are aqueous, they're dissolved in water. That's their physical state. And then wait a minute, barium is a plus two cation normally. Chromate's a minus two. This is a very polar compound. I thought we said polar dissolves polar. Yeah, well, that's, this is just a guideline. It's not perfect. Here's an example where it fails. This ionic compound, we can test it. It does not dissolve. Darn it. Well, in this case, we do find that there's ionic compounds that just don't dissolve in water. And if they don't dissolve, you call them insoluble. If they do dissolve, hey, they're soluble. More words, not too bad. The chemist comes along and say, well, can we predict this? Can we predict which compounds dissolve and which do not? Which ones are soluble and which ones are insoluble? And after a lot of study and a lot of trial and error, we've come up with some guidelines. Yeah, more guidelines. Like dissolves like was really nice and simple, but it doesn't cover everything. So here's an attempt to cover more cases. So there's actually five guidelines. Let's see if I can scroll this up enough. Um, the last one is like a catch-all. If it's not on the list, all other salts are insoluble. They don't dissolve. So the solubility guidelines really reduces to four things we need to remember. I know, but it's helpful. Um, if you got it up here, then you always have it. Don't have to go to your phone, which you can't use on exam anyways. So here we go. Um, here are the guidelines. Uh, the step one or first guideline is if your ionic compound, and remember ionic compounds have ions in them. There's a cation, there's an anion. And so the general um, word or name for ion compounds is just salts. We have table salt, sodium chloride, but any cation with another anion would make a different salt. So salts are ionic compounds, same, same thing. Okay, so take a look at the chemical formula. And if you find the ammonium ion, ooh, ammonium ion, NH4 plus, um, that's one of the polyatomic ions. Okay, so in a previous video, we talked about how we need to memorize the polyatomic ions. And here's a list for my class. So the ammonium ion second here on the list. Yeah, so here's a case where, yeah, it helps her have these memorized. I think it went too far. Okay, so the first guy line, you probably already read it, but it simply is if the molecule, the salt, has, an, uh, has the ammonium ion or one of the alkali metals, then it's ten, it tends to be soluble. And on the, on the exam, that's how I'll grade it. And in the lab, it's very likely that it'll dissolve in water. So where are the alkali metals? Well, again, things we had to memorize back, I think in unit one when we discussed the periodic table, remember we identified certain families. And the first column consists of the alkali metals. Remember we said that um, elements in the same column have similar properties because they all have the same number of electrons on their surface. The chemists would more typically say they have the same number of valence electrons, number of electrons in the outermost shell. Okay, so um, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, or francium, however it's pronounced. These are alkali metals, and they all have one electron on their surface. They all have one valence electron, and they tend to be very water soluble when they're mixed with an anion. Nice rule of thumb to remember. Okay, and then so we went on the left side of the table, alkali metals and ammonium ion. You know, it's a plus one cation, so it is similar to the other alkali metals. Rule two is, hey, swing over to the right side of the table. Look at the halides, chlorine, bromine, iodide. You're gonna throw out fluorine, it's weird, and it doesn't really follow the pattern. So we're gonna assume that fluoride is insoluble. You know, all these exceptions. But anyways, if you look at a chemical formula um, and it has chlorine, bromine, iodide, there's a really good chance it's soluble. Notable exceptions, in other words, the ones you need to know from my class, 
is if the cation is silver, lead, or mercury. And it's not any form of mercury, it's the mercury one form, one of the polyatomic ions. So down here, I think it's at the bottom of the first column. There it is. Mercury is right down here. And it's a polyatomic ion because there's two mercury atoms covalently attached together, and together they have a net plus two charge. Okay, that's the second guideline. Oh, you know what? Maybe I should list a few examples. So I might say, hey, is this molecule soluble in water? NaCl? And you could say, um, yeah, because Na is an alkaline metal. You can also go down the second um, guideline and say, wait, there's chlorine here, and it should be soluble, and Na is not silver, lead, or mercury. Cool. And then I might ask, well, let's see, how about copper bromide? Is that soluble? And you might go through the list, say, okay, is there an alkaline metal or ammonium ion? No, this is a cation, that's the anion. I don't see alkaline metal, no NH4. Try the second guy, like, ooh, bromine, yes. That's an anion in my salt of copper bromide. Um, so it's probably soluble, but double check, is copper one of the exceptions, mercury, lead, mer or silver? Nope, it's not. So this is a big yes. We expect that to dissolve in water. That's how the game is played, not too bad. Okay, third guideline is now sulfate comes into play. One of the polyatomic ions, yep. SO4, two minus, if you see that in your salt, it's probably soluble, except with mercury or lead again. So these follow through again. And silver sulfate somewhat soluble. Now, you'll see some other textbooks or in other instructors say, we're going to put that on the insoluble list. It's one of those borderline compounds. So in my class, the textbooks I've been referencing, silver sulfate tends to be soluble. Uh, it's borderline compound. I'll try to avoid putting that on the test. But anyways, sulfate is usually soluble, except for lead or mercury. And now take out the silver, which starts with an A, and put in the next letter of the alphabet, B, it's barium. Turns out barium sulfate is not very soluble at all. Cool. Okay, so if you see titanium sulfate, and I ask, hey, is that soluble? Well, you would say, ooh, sulfate's there. A third guideline says sulfates are usually soluble. Well, wait, is this barium, lead, or mercury? No, it's not. So yes, it's going to be soluble. And then if you saw this compound, mercury sulfate you go ooh sulfate says yes be soluble oh wait but mercury is there it's the poly um, polyatomic form of mercury so this is a no it's one of these exceptions okay i think the second and the third ones are the more di difficult ones because they have these notable exceptions but after that it gets somewhat normal again if you see nitrate perchlorate or acetate, and acetate goes by a couple different formulas. You can see this formula or the other one. Get ready for either one. Um, generally, those salts are soluble. No notable exceptions. And then final guideline is, hey, if you got the list of these four guidelines, ammonium with alkaline metals, halides, sulfates, nitrate, perchlorate, acetate, and there's something else there, and it's not on the list, our assumption will be it's probably not water-soluble. It's insoluble. Cool. So if you see something weird like, let me look at my notes, remind me of something that's on the list. How about um, iron hydroxide? Is that soluble? Well, the cation's Fe, so check out the cations. Ammonium, alkali metal, no. Fe is a transition metal. You get a periodic table on your exams. You could go here and take a look. Yep, here's iron, right in the center of the gap. That's a transition metal, not an alkali metal. Okay. Um, hydroxide, it's not one of the halides. 
it's not sulfate, it's not nitrate, it's not perchlorate, it's not acetate, oh, it's on the list. Then we're gonna assume no. If it's on the list, assume it's insoluble. Cool. Nice. So do what you can about memorizing these lists of guidelines because you're gonna be using them. Um, sometimes I'll just give you a formula like I did here, titanium sulfate. Hey, are you soluble? So you have to know the solubility rules in order to predict that. But another application of solubility rules is like this one here. So there might be an exam, might be, probably will be, an exam question that says, hey, write the balance equation, and they'll tell you two reagents. In this case, I say, hey, I'll write the balance equation for the aqueous reaction between calcium chloride and sodium oxalate. And it turns out, you can't tell by glance, at a glance here that it's a precipitation reaction, but it is. And so what do you do? Well, I got a little procedure here. Um, step one, convert these words to formulas. Write the chemical formula of reactants. To do that, you need the periodic table, which you get on exam, so you don't have to have that memorized. But oxalate's not on the periodic table, so you definitely have to know your polyatomic ions. Okay, um, well, let's do step one right now. Calcium chloride, so calcium, go find on the periodic table. It's over here on my uh, left. Calcium's element number 20. It has chemical symbol Ca. These are ionic compounds, so Ca must be an ion. So let's predict its charge. It's in column two, it has two valence electrons. It's also a metal. Now the staircase over here separates the non-metals upper right from the metals, nickel, copper, silver. Those are metals. Everything on the left side here, the diagonal line, are metals. They tend to lose electrons. Calcium in its pure state is a metal. It wants to lose those two valence electrons so that it has, instead of having a total number of 20 electrons, it would much rather have 18 and pretend it's argon. Or in other words, it has a set of closed shells. It makes it stable. Okay, so calcium is a plus two and has the symbol Ca2 plus. And then chloride, well, it sounds like chlorine. And that's how you name it, and how you know it's a, an ionic compound, is because we have a metal with a non-metal, and it ends with ide in order to name it. So chlorine, sorry about that. Um, chlorine on the periodic table has chemical symbol Cl. It's in column seven, seven valence electrons. It much would rather have eight to give it an octet. Or you can think about 17 electrons going to 18. One more electron, it'll also have the same electronic configuration as argon, and that makes it much more stable with closed shells. Chlorine wants one electron. Okay, so there's a formula, right? No, remember, nature has that other rule that says, hey, if the elements decide to give away electrons or take on extra ones, the number of protons and electrons are not balanced. So group up cations with anions so you can balance all the charge. That in your new compound, your new substance, for the smallest unit, a molecule, if you will, or a a formula, you have to have the same number of protons as electrons. You need to balance the charge. And so we need to bring in a second chlorine so that together is a net minus two charge to balance calciums plus two. So the formula of calcium chloride is CaCl2. Okay, let's do sodium oxalate. So sodium, you've seen that enough times, you probably don't need the periodic table. It's element 11. Symbol Na, it is an alkali metal, so it loses one electron, one valence electron, wants to kick it out to form Na plus. And then we're stuck with oxalate. You'd have to go look at the polyatomic ions, but we're supposed to memorize it. It's actually C2O4, two minus. And that's not the formula for the whole compound, right? We need to balance the charge. 
So two sodiums, right? To get a net plus two charge, the balance oxalates negative two. So the full chemical formula of our reagents are NaCl2 and Na2C2O4. That was step one. Okay, let's move down a little bit. I will work underneath these, the procedure here. So step two is predict the products. So right now we know, or we're told from the, the problem, hey, mix some calcium chloride with them sodium oxalate, and something happens, and then they don't tell us what happens. We need to predict it. So there's um, another way to classify reactions. There's subs let's see, synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, and double displacement reactions. Um, in my class, I tend to focus on a second way of classifying reactions. And for us, three reactions, precipitation reaction, oxidation reduction reaction, and acid-base reactions. They'll, they'll cover them. But if you go on the internet and Google double displacement, that's another way to classify reactions. And what you do, or at least I, what I think about doing, is you take the cation from the first compound, right? Cations are positive. They're positively charged like a cat meow. That's how I remember it. And sodium is the other cation. And you switch them. Instead of calcium um, sticking to chloride ions, hey, calcium, go stick to oxalate. And let's put it down here. So calcium, you're going to stick to oxalate. And what are the charges? Well, we already found them. Calcium is a plus two. Oxalate is a minus two. And then, okay, let's get the sodium. Hey, don't stick to oxalate. Go pair up with chloride. So we're switching the cations. Sodium was with the oxalate, paired up with chlorine. Calcium, you were with the chlorine. Go pair up with oxalate. And those may predict our products. And at this level we're getting of a uh, General chemistry, chem six, that's good enough. That's gonna work here, it's a double displacement reaction. Swapping out the two cations. And now check your charges, plus two balances and minus two, good. This is a good chemical formula. And NaCl, yep, that's a good chemical formula as well. Nice. Now what? Uh, step three, balance the equation. Okay. And remember our guidelines? There's two important ones. One, do not change the subscripts, right? So over here, for example, there's two sodiums, but right now on the right, I only have two. Don't make your table salt formula Na2Cl. That's not the formula. No, so that's out of bounds. Cannot change subscripts. The second guideline is save the simplest looking molecule for last. Um, and there's two ways to define what simple or complicated formulas look like. The two ways are, hey, molecules with a lot of elements, a lot of different elements, an Na, a C, and an O, carbon and oxygen. That's more complicated than just having a Ca and a Cl. The other way is to minimize your subscripts. So in this formula, calcium chloride, there's a two. But over here on sodium chloride, there are no subscripts. I think of sodium chloride having the simplest formula. And the guideline for balancing equations says, well, don't balance the simplest formula yet. Don't balance the Na, don't balance the Cl, go after somebody else. Calcium, carbon, or oxy oxygen, and just pick. I'm gonna pick calcium. That's kind of nice because there's one calcium on the left and one calcium on the right. Nice. Um, it's balanced. Check carbon. Yeah, there's two carbons here and there's also two carbons. Excellent. How about oxygen? Four and four. Sweet, this is going really easily. Nice. All right, so now I'll try sodium and chloride. Sodium, we got two. So I put a two here, and that gives us two chlorines. And yes, that balance the chlorines. So we're balanced. Nice. Lastly, a properly balanced equation also contains physical states. So we have to predict or gather information from the problem as to what these molecules are doing. And there's four choice, choices for physical states, right? Molecules can be in the gas phase, the liquid phase, solid phase, 
or they can be dissolved in water or aqueous. Well, the problem actually told us we have an aqueous reaction. So for a precipitation reaction, you could just go ahead and assume these are soluble. But to make sure, you should verify it with the solubility rules. So let's give it a look. Calcium chloride, well, we just went over solubility rules. Chloride was one of our second guidelines here. Salts of the halides, chloride should be soluble, except for silver, lead, or mercury. Silver, lead, or mercury. Silver, lead, or mercury. Silver, lead, or mercury. No, this is calcium. This is soluble. And if it's soluble, the physical state is aqueous. How about sodium oxalate? Well, sodium is the first in the first uh, column. It's an alkali metal. Yep, there's sodium. And that's um, our first guideline. Salts, oh, sorry, I'm cut off here. Salts of the ammonium ion and of the alkali metals should be soluble. Nice. So we can put an AQ on the sodium oxalate. And now we have calcium oxalate. Calcium oxalate is not on the solubility guidelines list. Calcium is nowhere to be found. Oxalate is nowhere to be found on any of these four rules. Therefore, we assume it's insoluble. Okay. So if it's insoluble, it's not aqueous. It actually is. Oh, soluble. I'm um, sorry. Solid. It's a solid. Mm, that's a little unnerving, right? Solubility rules. The S over here is a little confusing. Remember the S sense for solid. And then lastly, table salt. You either just know from experience, yeah, if there's any water around and you put some NaCl in it, it will dissolve. NaCl soluble. Or you could say sodium comes from alkaline metal. It's supposed to be soluble. Rule two of the soluble rules, chloride is soluble, we got it. And there is our full and complete balance equation with physical states, and we're done. Finally, we can point out a precipitation reaction based on the pattern. And the pattern is this, um, for a properly written precipitation reaction, you should have both reagents, the starting materials on the left, they should be aqueous, dissolved in water. And then at least one, and usually it's only one, of your products will be solid, insoluble. Right, it has to rain out a solution. Do this up here, there it is. <laughs> it's gotta be precipitating out a solution. Cool. Um, I like this example of calcium um, what was it, calcium chloride and sodium oxalate, um, because there's a connection to biology here. It turns out that the precipitate, the calcium oxalate here that's insoluble, that's one of the compounds found in kidney stones. What? Yeah. Um, so in our food, right, so somehow these materials, calcium and oxalate, has to get inside us and make its way to the kidneys and then precipitate out, rain out a solution within the kidneys and start plugging up the erythra. I forget the name of those, those tubes from the kidneys down to the bladder, but ouch. <laughs> from a chemistry point of view, what's going on? Well, a lot of foods contain calcium and some of the sources of calcium might be calcium chloride. Oxalate, I had to look it up, but it's found in nuts and then beans and spinach. Not a lot of it, but there's some. And so eating foods like nuts and spinach, you're going to take in some oxalate. And you hopefully it'll stay in the soluble form so you can make its way to the urine and get out of the body. But if they'll find some calcium along the way, it might precipitate out. Um, I'm no doctor, but I would suggest eating some cheese when you have your beans and your spinach. Uh, cheese has some calcium in it. Spinach is going to have the oxalate. So why don't we have the precipitation reaction happen in the stomach so we never make its way to the, the bloodstream, make its way to the kidney. So just my two bits. I'm not a doctor. 
but it makes chemical sense to me. All right, that's enough for now. Thanks for watching.